All right, couple of other short questions or quick questions related to movement disorder. Uh, is there anywhere we have spec scan in Pakistan? Um, we we probably do, um, and I think there is spec scan available in Ah Khan. There is spec scan available in uh, Shokat Khanum, probably Shifa, and few other hospitals. Spec scan is easy. Uh, spectra, spec scan is a spectroscopy scan uh, or it's a specialized scan that is often done with CT scan so there's an add-on to the CT scan an additional sensor that can that can do the spec scan that's usually not the hard part the the more difficult part is getting the right tracer or dye is, is a inappropriate word tracer is probably the more important word spec scan picks up uh, radiation signal coming from somewhere and co-localizes with the CAT scan onto onto the body. Now that radiation signal has to come from something that is giving out radiation and that means that something that is not stable um, and will is converting from something to something. And usually these conversions are of an element that we use, there are many different conversions in nature, but the one that we use is the emission of gamma radiation and it's related to conversion of a, 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 an element such as iodine from a, an unstable state to a stable state. So there's a natural occurring state of iodine um, that is present often, but there are certain states of iodine which are also present in nature, but they are energized state of iodine. There's something extracted to iodine that iodine cannot hold for long so it, it gives it off so it's additional neutrons or additional proton or things like that and as it gives them off then it also releases radiation energy that's picked up by scanner can be picked up by scanner that's also by the way is how carbon dating is done so c12 uh, is the stable carbon c13 and c14 are the carbons that are unstable and over time they will convert to c12 now the uh, the conversion follows a pattern which is called half-life meaning that over a fixed time half of that unstable element would convert into a stable element and so it's always half. So it doesn't matter if you have a one kilogram, 1,000 kilogram, or 100,000 kilogram, half of that material, as much as it is, will convert all this in that fixed time. And that can be seconds, minutes, hours, days, years. I think carbon dating is used because carbon have hundreds of years, thousands of years, and half of that will convert into something uh, in, in things like that. And, and the way carbon dating is done, by the way, is that there is a known normal... Um, for for organic substance, if you're eating, the food has a known amount of unstable carbon, C14, and that will go and incorporate into your body. And so a normal person who's who's living or is about to die has a certain amount of carbon-14 in them. And uh, and so is true for other like trees and other, other natural products, whoever absorb uh, organic compounds. So you know how much there should be when someone died and now how much is left, you can tell how old that dead body is. You know, it has to be in hundreds of years, thousands of years, it cannot be done for one year or two years because of a um, long period needed. Anyways, that's <laughs> that was a side discussion. But the point is that you need a special dye. And not only you need a nice isotope like iodine, radioactive iodine, for the spec scan, you need for it to go to bind to a specific area or cell that you want to study. So each cell in each area will have a different dye. So for example, uh, I use a special spec scan in Parkinson's disease, which is called DAT scan, D-A-T, DAT scan. And that stands for dopamine transporter scan. D-A is dopamine, T is for transporter, dopamine transporter scan. And that scan uses a radioactive iodine. And the iodine is attached to this, what is called ligand which is a chemical that will go and bind to a specific area in the brain. This chemical is designed to go into the brain and bind to the dopamine receptors and type 2 dopamine receptors. And type 2 dopamine receptors are present at the nerve endings to reabsorb dopamine that was released. So the nerve, the, the neurons that have dopamine, their endings release dopamine and they have these special receptors called D2, type 2 D dopamine receptors that will reuptake that dopamine some of it you know it's usually five ten percent but not you know more than that they will reuptake some of it so that they can reuse it rather than keep producing new one 
uh, and that special receptor is where the uh, this ligand will go and bind and otherwise it will not attach to anything else and will be peed out so if you inject it into the blood and you wait and it circulate and circulate and it will go some of it will go to the brain it will absorb and bind to that and once it binds it's stuck it's going to stay there for uh, a while and that, a while is usually about you know i i would say four to eight hours 12 hours at most uh, until again it's it's detached but if if there was some, anywhere else it won't bind and whatever doesn't bind will just get peed out from the urine so if there was nothing in the brain that will attach it then will just get peed out or nothing in the body they will attach it now the the point is that we we give this dye we wait we see how much was absorbed by the brain and that tells a rough idea how many d2 receptors they have in the brain and why do we need to know that because dopamine producing cells are the only one that will have d2 receptors and so knowing how much receptors you have will give you an idea of how many dopamine cells they have and there's a loss of dopamine cells which causes parkinson so it's a way of finding out if someone has parkinson's indirectly by figuring out if they have loss of dopamine producing cells so it's a very very roundabout way of doing it but bottom line is that the spec scan is suspect sensors that are available in pakistan but that dye that you need to do the dat scan with is not available in pakistan well why is it not available is because you need to have a process of creating that dye because remember it's an unstable dye that iodine is quickly breaking off and you don't want to create something like c14 carbon 14 which will then take 150 years or 200 years to dissolve you need answers now you need to do a test while the patient is in in the hospital or in the in the cat scan so you need a dye that will have a measurable impact within few hours will quickly absorb and quickly go away and will not become part of the body so you need to produce that artificially through uh, um accelerators electron accelerators so the, these are special machines that can speed up electron and they they start speeding up electron and as electron speeds up it gathers more and more energy and once it has a lot of energy then they can move it and strike something so strike something like iodine bind to a this this ligand and then that iodine absorbs those electron beaming at it at a very high speed and becomes ready and now it's ready for 24 hours if you don't use that dye in 24 hours it will go back to its natural state and it will be useless for us you cannot see it on the pictures although it will still go into the blood if you inject it it will still go to the brain bind it there for 8 or 12 hours or something but right now it's is useless because you cannot tell it's there or not because you don't see the radiation coming out of the brain the radiation is already gone within first 24 hours or so so you have to prepare it fresh and use it so you need that kind of a process to prepare those dyes which are short lived and unstable and to prepare that you need that raw ligand and i'm not sure how long is that stable for um you know maybe it's only for a few days and you cannot ship it from another country you have to prepare lag and locally in a local laboratory something like that so long discussion short what i'm trying trying to say is that spec scans are easily available in pakistan in many centers the ligands and the dyes and tracers that you need the the drugs are the one that are missing in pakistan and that's why many tests are not doable i i looked around and i talked with people to see if the dat scan can be brought in pakistan the problem will be affordability you know if you want to do bring a test that cost you know in us it costs about 2000 3000 let's say 2000 so in pakistan rupees will be what 3 lakh rupees 3 3.3 million that um, is not affordable you know who's you know even rich people will hesitate doing a test that expensive um and so there's no incentive for drug companies to bring something to the market in Pakistan because the costs are so cheap that you have to have uh, you know anything that's expensive if you don't have enough par- profit margins it's not worth doing it you know why waste our time anyways so let's wrap up with the last uh, question uh, kindly elaborate about chorea ethetosis and its relevance to localization so these are different types of movement disorders movement disorders are divided into what type of movement that you're seeing um at some point we'll try to go into a little bit more detail of it uh so these types are tremors uh, dystonia chorea ethetosis tics uh, myoclonus uh there are some uncommon ones so there is the uh, moving uh, painful fingers moving toes there's jumpy stump there is uh, lata uh and and so on so there's about 
I would roughly say about 20 different types of movement uh, that are generally classified. And then there's sub classification of these tremors. So dystonia have further classification, Korea has further classification, uh, tremors have further classification and so on. But there are overall 20 main classes of different types of movement. Now, their role in localization is not very good. And the reason being that 95% of abnormal movements come from basal ganglia. Basal ganglia is these collections of nuclei uh, right around thalamus. So there is part of thalamus that's also considered part of basal ganglia, but not the whole thalamus. Um, but the basal ganglia is basically the globus pallidus interna, globus pallidus externa, the putamen, the caudate, uh, subthalamic nucleus, and then there are some associated areas such as some part of thalamus, part, part of red nucleus, and, and so on. All of these structures together form a complex system of movement uh, control. They basically control the precision of movement, and you know, someday we may talk about it. But basal ganglia is basically 95% of abnormal movements are coming from. And then if you add cerebellum, that's probably 99%. And there's only 1% left that comes from cerebral cortex or brainstem or, or, or nerves or something like that. So it, these movements don't have a huge localization benefit unless in acute state. So someone presenting with a stroke and has these kind of a jer jerky movement what we call bellism, then we often think about a stroke in the subthalamic nucleus, part of basal ganglia, or parietal cortex. Why parietal cortex? That's complicated. You know, so supplementary motor area is part of the basal ganglia loop, but you know, it's, a, it's a separate discussion. But, but the point is that in acute state, they may have some localization benefit um, with strokes or something like that. But otherwise, in the long run, if a patient's coming in with three years history of tremors or, or two years history of chorea or four years history of Parkinson's, there is not a huge localization benefit because they're all coming from basal ganglia and often you don't see anything on imaging. In movement disorders, that's what I practice, you know, 99% of the time, the localization is not very helpful. So how do we diagnose patients? And that's where these classification into different categories is the most important factor. A patient coming in with abnormal movements or involuntary movements or jerky movements, their diagnosis rests on this idea of what is the class of that abnormal movement. Is the movement a tremor, a dystonia, a dystonic tremor, a myoclonic tremor, a tick, a chorea, a cathesia, bellism? What is that movement? And how many movements are present? It may be that the patient has three different types of tremor. A patient has uh, ecathesia and uh, bellism or, or dystonia and chorea. And, and in all of that, different pieces of phenomena, you piece them out separately and then put it together to try to diagnose the disease or syndrome that is presenting with those phenomena. So th the, uh, the word we use for these classes of movement is phenomena. Uh, Korea is a phenomena and attacks is a phenomena, tremor is a phenomena. And the art of putting these phenomena, figuring out which phenomena are present, how many and, and what subtypes is called phenomenology. So phenomenology or study of the phenomena of, of movement is the main cornerstone or foundation actually, not cornerstone, a whole stone, a slab on which the whole building of movement is sort of set. So there are uh, 1,200 there are 1,200 diagnoses in movement disorders, part of neurology. A uh, common one, at least at about 100 or so, 120, 150. And to figuring out which of these 100 movement disorders is it, uh, rest on phenomenology. Let's take a very simple example. Someone age 45 is coming to you with a tremor that started uh, you know, six months ago. Now the question is that is it essential tremor? Patient says he has no family history. Is it essential tremor still because the patient, you know, even despite not having family history? Or is it a Parkinson's tremor? A patient has a young onset Parkinson's disease. Or is it a dystonic tremor? A patient has a new onset unilateral dystonia um, at this age or maybe have a genetic dystonia such as um, Oppenheimer type 1, DYT1 or something like that. Um, or patient has a medication side effect. And these are myoclonic tremor. All of that rests on the art of phenomenology to separate out essential tremor from Parkinson's tremor, from dystonic tremor, from myoclonic tremor, from drug-induced tremor, from neuropathic tremor, from drug uh, 
uh, enhanced physiological tremor and so on. So that is the more important art in localization of movement disorders than the localization that we talked about uh, so far.